I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, uh, to the book of James. <clears throat> Again, I want to say Happy New Year's. Uh, my prayer for you is that God will give you and I a fresh new anointing for 2012. And I pray that God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And for the last couple of days, God's put that in my spirit. And everybody I've come in contact with <clears throat> seem to have welcomed, uh, they seem to welcome uh, a fresh new anointing from God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, I always want a fresh new anointing from God. And I certainly uh, want God to supply all by need uh, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And that's the only way I want it. Somebody say amen. I want God's blessing is what I'm trying to say. And you need God's blessing. Uh, there, there's a way to survive <coughs> in this world. And that's without God. People do survive all the way from birth to life without God, and they die and go to hell. There's a church in the house today. Yeah, that's the basics. That's basics 101 of the gospel. You live your life without Jesus, you'll die and go to hell. Somebody say amen. And then there's another way, and it's the only way for God, and that's the Jesus way. Somebody say amen. amen. And uh, I want to follow Jesus. And I want my blessings in life to come from him. <coughs> Many today in America <clears throat> are on one of those two paths. We've entered into a dispensation, uh, the year 2012, that has spiritual significance, uh, to say the least. You know, 12 is a special number in the Bible. It's like the number 7. It, it speaks of completeness. Did, did you know that? Amen. You know, God made the world, and God set a moon and sun, and God gave earth seasons. Can I get a witness? And 12 months makes one year. It's a number of completion. It, it serves the purpose of God. Completion, divine completion, always serves the purpose of God. Can I get a witness? Then, of course, Jacob, you know, had 12 sons. Can I, can I get a witness? And those 12 sons became 12 tribes. Can I get a witness? And when those 12 sons became 12 tribes... Guess what God got? He got a holy nation, the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel served God's complete purpose. Woo! Y'all follow me? Are y'all getting this? I said Israel served God's complete purpose. Well, how did he do that, preacher? Well, he brought, they brought Jesus into the world. Somebody say amen. I can't think of a more complete purpose, amen, than to bring Messiah into the world, amen, and God's will was majorly accomplished in the person of Jesus Christ, can I get a witness, and then what did God do, through Jesus, his son, his complete plan of salvation, his complete unique son, that son chose twelve disciples a complete a complete foundation for another great purpose and those disciples was the foundation Jesus being the chief cornerstone for another holy nation boy y'all got quiet what 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 nation well, it's the nation of the born-again church. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Y'all don't know that we're a holy nation? 
in Christ Jesus. Can I get a witness? The church is a holy nation. We're a priesthood, a perfect priesthood built in Jesus Christ. We are his body. Can I get a witness? Oh, yes. And believe it or not, Jesus is coming back for his body, the church. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Somebody give God a hand clap. As a student of prophecy, <coughs> I'm not going to go there today. I, that's not my purpose uh, is to get into prophecy. But pro- prophecy has been fulfilled up to where Jesus Christ could come back any moment. There is no prophetic fulfillment necessary now. We've reached that point in time. There's, we're not waiting on anything to be fulfilled now for Jesus to come back in the clouds of glory. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? The rapture could take place any moment. As I've been praying and seeking the Lord, the Lord spoke to me and I was asking God. I said, Lord, what's significant about 2012? Uh, What motto should I use for our church? as a vision for 2012. And the Lord told me, tell the people to pray for a fresh new anointing and that God shall supply all their need according to His riches. Somebody say amen. In glory through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I said, Lord, is there any more than that? And the Lord brought into my spirit that this is 2012. And it has spiritual significance. I personally believe, amen, I personally believe that 2012 marks the official beginning of sorrows for the world. Somebody say amen. What do you mean by that, Brother Harris? (laughs) Jesus warned in Matthew. Somebody say amen. That when we see nations rising against nations and kingdoms rising up against kingdoms, when you see earthquakes in divers places, somebody say amen, when you see pestilence and war and famine occurring on a multiple scale, he says these are the beginnings of sorrows. I believe that 2012 ushers in the official beginnings of sorrows for mankind. He said, well, Brother Harris, why does that excite you? Because uh, when the world begins uh, into the sorrows, uh, that means we can look up because the coming of Christ is at hand. The second coming of Jesus Christ is ever imminent. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You've seen those that try to scare the world with a mind calendar saying that 2012 is going to be the beginning or it's going to bring the end of the world. That's not true. That's not true. I don't need a mind calendar. i got a holy Bible to tell me what time it is. Somebody say amen. I've got the Word of God to let me know what time I'm living in. Hallelujah. We're living in the last days. Hallelujah. And the troubles of this world are clear signs that Jesus has given His church uh, that His coming uh, is at hand. uh, And we are to mark uh, this year and watch uh, and wait uh, and expect uh, Him to split that eastern sky and to send uh, out of heaven uh, with a shout and with a voice of the archangel. And the trumpet of God is going to sound soon. And those that are saved and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ are going to be raptured up into heaven to be with the Lord forevermore and to comfort each other with these words. Somebody give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. It don't take a genius or an ecologist or a scientist or a seismologist to tell you that the world's in trouble. You ain't got to be a doctor. Are you listening to me? Or a lawyer? Or a politician? 
to tell me the world was in trouble. Jesus told us, hallelujah, 2,000 years ago in the last days that things will wax worse and worse and worse. Amen. It's almost, it's almost funny if it weren't so sad how that people are desperately looking to our politicians to deliver us from the unforeseen dangers of the future. I don't care if you're a Democrat, a liberal, or a Republican. I'm not looking. I'm not looking in that direction for my source of hope or strength. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Well, who are you looking to, preacher? I'm looking unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of my faith. Somebody say amen. And that's who you better be looking to, hallelujah, as you make your journey toward heaven in this dispensation of 2012. You better keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. In the book of James, chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 5, chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. Somebody say amen. amen. But when you ask God for wisdom, and that means for understanding, for foresight, you ask him in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Now I want you to go to chapter 2 and verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Watch this which he hath promised to them that love him. Do you see there that God promises a kingdom for those that love him? I can't hear you. Amen. Is it in the word? Amen. Amen. That the church is not headed for destruction. We're headed to be a part of a kingdom. Hallelujah. God is leading us toward his kingdom and the fulfillment of his kingdom. He hath promised to them that love him. But ye have despised the poor. Listen to this. Do not rich men oppress you. Listen to the wisdom of James. Don't rich people oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called. Watch this. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. God is saying if you'll just be willing as a Christian to love your neighbor as yourself, ye do well. Somebody give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <coughs> the royal law is to love the Lord, follow the Lord, and treat your neighbor as yourself. We're not to look to the rich for our deliverance. We're reminded here in the Word, hallelujah, that rich men always have and always will oppress the poor. Amen. Who are these rich people? Is it a brother or sister in the church doing well? No. No. It's the people that rules the world. Are you listening to me? We are not to look to those in government. Are you listening to me? We are not to trust those in government. We are not to look to them as our source. We, the church, are to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ because my God can supply and shall supply all your need regardless of what the rich folks at the top of the government do Amen. now as we look around the world we're living in 
Looks like the rich folks ain't doing a good job in governing the nations. It looks like the rich folks in America. Let, let me start at home. The Bible says judgment must begin in the house of God. Somebody say amen. Before I talk about other nations, uh, let me talk about our nation. Our political leaders uh, have made some foolish, selfish, greedy decisions that's put every American at risk today. I've never known of a time in my life And I'm 55 years old. I'm educated. I'm a history student. I love history. I've researched history. I've never saw, never read about any time in history where the world was more vulnerable. Are you listening to me? More flaky, more unstable, more unsure than the world we're living in today. You better listen to me carefully. The world today is in a worse off condition than when Hitler almost conquered the world. We're more vulnerable today than the world was then. Why is that? Well, I could get up here and give you a big history lesson, but to keep it short and blunt... We got psychos in North Korea with nuclear weapons. Ahmadinejad now Rahana is a idiot, a, a demon possessed idiot acquiring nuclear weapons. Are you listening to me? We've got Pakistan and India, unstable nations, deadly enemies next door to one another with nuclear weapons. Somebody say, man, we live every day under a nuclear threat. And Jesus warned that in the last days there would be these kind of famines and pestilences. Now watch this. I hadn't even mentioned natural disasters. The Bible says not to trust in rich people to provide for you, to take care of you. Because all they're going to do is take care of themselves. Somebody say Amen. And before you go mark me as unpatriotic, I want to remind you I served in the Army and the United States Navy. I'm dishonorably discharged from both. Honorably discharged from both, not dishonorably discharged. (laughs) Amen. Conflict in my interest there. I have a honorable discharge from both. I'm very patriotic. During the first Persian War, I was willing... To go into the military as a chaplain. Many of you don't know this, but I tried to get back in. And I was too old, they said. Amen. I love America. And that's why today I'm going to share with you some principles that can save your life. And of course, what I'm going to preach today and teach today and lecture today are things that would apply to global need. So no matter where you're at in the world, if you'll get your pen and paper out, I will tell you things that you, you'll possibly need to survive in the future. Amen. <coughs> I could talk about the possibility of war, a dirty bomb. I could talk about terrorists attacking the United States again. But did you know that today most Americans say they believe that the United States is on the verge of an economic collapse. Did you know that's the greatest concern of the, of 70 plus percent of Americans? They are afraid that the American dollar is going to fail. And can I tell you that that is a legitimate concern. Economically, the world is teeter and totting. Somebody say amen. The world's economy is like an egg. I would sit right here on the edge and keep pushing the egg uh, to get it balanced. Are you listening to me? At any moment, uh, that's what kind of pressure we're under economically in the world. They, they're pushing the dollar. Are you listening to me? To its limit. We're borrowing completely out of control. Are you listening to me? I couldn't run my household like the government's running its household. You couldn't either. Somebody say amen. It's a very possibility there could be an economic collapse of the dollar in America. 
And if there, if there, that happens, if this does come to pass, most people are not prepared. Most people, most people, if our economy went bankrupt, most people only could survive for about a month on what they have in their homes. Now, if America is attacked by terrorists with a nuclear bomb, that could offset the world economy. If Ahmadinejad <coughs> tries to block the Strait of Hormuz, uh, the United States ain't going to let that happen. Are you listening to me? They will not let that happen. Israel will not let that happen. If Israel's attacked, they will have to defend their son. Somebody say amen. I mean, have I got you sold on that the world's in trouble yet? I mean, I can go on and on and on and on and on. Well, what do we do? I'm going to tell you what you don't do. The first thing you don't do is put your trust in man and don't put your trust in uncertain riches. The Bible teaches the child of God not to trust in money. Don't get, let your money get hoarded up to where you think your money can take care of you because as sure as you start putting your trust in money, it will fail you. Do you hear today what the Spirit of God God is saying to the church and how most people today in America are trying to deal with the unforeseen dangers we're facing they're trying to hoard up money listen to me if the dollar collapses if America goes bankrupt we would be in more trouble than as a nation than we were during the great depression why is that it's because this generation of people today don't know how to farm. They don't know how to hunt. Are you listening to me? They don't even really know how to work together. The majority of the American people, if there was a real crisis, would literally starve to death. Literally starve to death. <coughs> And it bothers me as a pastor to see so many people living in this turbulent time naive. Here are things that you can do to secure yourself, to save yourself and your family. Should such a crisis hit America? And for those of you around the world, this advice will help you. First of all, every family, every family needs storable food. I can't believe, I can't believe in 2012 on the first day of the year, God has got this message on my heart. But the Holy Spirit has led me to tell you to be a good steward, not to become a hoarder. And the Holy Ghost has just spoke that over and over in my spirit. Make sure my people know they are not to hoard, but to trust me. Do not hoard, but trust me. And I said, well, God, to what degree are we to trust you? What are we to do? What am I to tell these people? And the Lord says, tell them to be good stewards over what I have blessed them with. Did you know that good stewardship is very biblical? As a matter of fact, you're not practicing good Christianity if you're not a good steward over the things that God has blessed you with. So preacher, can you prove that in the Bible? I, have, you, have you got three months... We don't have to do that. Let's turn to Proverbs 6.6. 6. Everybody turn in your Bible to Proverbs 6.6. 6. It don't take a lot of sense. It don't, you don't have to be a genius to understand Proverbs 6.6. 6 because God uses the analogy of a little ant. 
of a little ant to teach you stewardship. Amen. Proverbs 6, 6. Are you there? If you're there, hold your Bibles up. Shake them out be somebody. All right, half of us are there. And the other half either didn't bring your Bible. Shame on you. Oh, some of you's got them on the computer. I, but I, hey, see my point. See my point. We're an electronic generation. And that's all right. I wish I had one of them fancy things you could get the Bible on. But look here. Proverbs 6 6 says, Consider the ant. Can I paraphrase this and just, just make it real plain? Consider the ant, you idiot. You lazy slob. Consider her ways. Does she not in the summer months gather in for a winter that she's not seen? Oh, y'all feel the Holy Ghost? I can feel a witness. The Bible is saying here that even an ant, the smallest of all God's creations, has enough sense to take some of God's blessings and store it up for a winter that's coming. Are you listening to me? Do you know the math on, on, on ant farming? Most ants are born in the spring. Are you listening to me? And they don't live long. But instinctively, as a little ant, they know uh, instinctively that winter could come. And they work and save. Somebody say amen. They work and they save because they've got enough sense to know that a cold day is inevitable. We're living in the last days. Listen to me. Hear ye the Spirit of God. We are living in the last days. The coming of Christ is at hand. We are going to see the sorrows that Jesus said would begin in our generation. I'm back on prophecy now. And can I tell you, this generation won't pass away until all things concerning the rapture of the church are fulfilled. Mm, my God. So brother, here's what you're talking about. I'm talking about Israel. I'm talking about Israel. Somebody say amen. I'm talking about that tiny nation of Israel. The clock has started and time is running out for the world. But God will take care of His people if they'll only practice good stewardship. I don't fear nothing that can come upon America. Or the world. Or the church. As long as we've got our faith in Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. But as a good Christian. You need to store food. For you and your family. And in the good Christian spirit. For others. Can I get a witness? Somebody give God a hand clap. I believe that we ought to stock up for a good three months on storable food. Storable food. Amen. I believe that it's wise for every Christian to invest in seeds for a garden. This, we're still on number one. Storable foods. Well, I'll just wait till the crisis comes and I'll run down to the Walmart. Hadn't you learned from Katrina? The federal government can't even save one city. Did y'all not see that? They could not save one American city. There was lawlessness in New Orleans. People were starving. Women were being raped in the Superdome. I heard the testimony that a man shot his sister in the face with a gun over a bag of ice. Ain't that right, Brother John? Preacher killed over... Well, I don't want to get into all of it. Y'all do know that I'm telling you the truth, right? How many feels like we need to hear this word? You need to invest in seed. 
that it would take a year and a half to lecture you on every aspect of how to survive a disaster. But I'm giving you a crash course to get you through most disasters. You need to invest in seeds that you can plant. And you need to invest in storable foods for for a long enough period so that before that's ate up, you could plant a garden. And did you know, if you know anything at all about gardening, you can take a half an acre of land. Your front yard, if you do it right, can grow more things than you'll be able to eat, you and your family. You'll have to give some of it away. Somebody say amen. Hey, I'm a farmer. I know. I don't think it would hurt every Christian family to go buy about six hens and a rooster. And build you a little chicken pen to get eggs from. Am I ridiculous or is it y'all feel like God's saying something to us? <coughs> if there's city ordinances against owning chickens for the noise factor, get the hens, don't get the rooster. <coughs> but as for me and my house, we like roosters. We need to keep around the house clean water. Did you know you can go about a month or so without eating? But most doctors and scientists will tell you, you will drop dead. If you go around three days without water, you will die. And if the national disaster or local disaster, if it's natural or man-made And the hydrant quits working. You need to have you storable water. Write that down. Number two. Storable water. Every family needs to keep clean water. A few days you'll die without water. If your tap stop. Have a plan. Thirdly, you need a shelter of some type. (laughs) It sounds like we're planning a camping trail, but I'm sorry, folks. Just a good, cheap, economical, cheap tent would provide you temporary shelter just about any place, anywhere, and it packs and carries quickly. I come this close, this close to buying a nine-man tent for Christmas. Every family should have a tent to shelter everybody in that household. And being Christian, maybe sharing some room with others who are desperate during the crisis. And you can buy a really good tent. I'm talking about a really good tent for around $174. That'll last you a lifetime. Every family should have temporary shelter. Amen. Fourthly, to survive a disaster, you need to pack, pre-pack, pre-pack warm clothing. Warm clothing and summer clothing. For you and your family. I've got a form I'm going to get my staff to fill out or, or, or copy it where you can take it home and fill it out. And in each family member's bag where you pack the clothing and the other items I'll get to in a moment, you'll put this in there in case of a disaster or they're separated from you. You never know when a disaster is going to hit. I was driving down the parkway when on my radio I heard the trembling voice of news announcers saying 
a jet airplane just flew in to one of the Twin Towers. My mouth dropped open. My military experience told me that could not be an accident. We were under attack. We were at war with somebody. Americans, you're living too loose. You've become too naive. You've become too soft. Somebody say amen. We're living in a dangerous time that God forewarned us about. God's going to do His part. I'll get to that in just a moment. God will do His part. But God expects you to do your part. And your part is to plan. Somebody say amen. That's your responsibility as a good steward of God, like the little ant, to take time and save and plant and invest in a rainy day. Every, every family needs a good axe. Write that down. A good axe. It serves so many purposes that any outdoorsman, any hunter would tell you that an axe is an invaluable tool. And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, I got a big chainsaw, preacher. Let me tell you something. In a real crisis, you ain't going to have gas and all for a chainsaw. You better hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. You need an axe, a good quality axe, and it needs to be very sharp. Not only to cut wood for a fire so you can cook, are you listening to me? Where you can bathe, but an axe is a good weapon to defend yourself against wild animals and dogs that will be roaming the streets. Some of you are saying, Preacher, come on now. No, go back to Katrina. The dogs packed up. The dogs packed up and literally attacked people in New Orleans. While the government was twirling their fingers. People starved. People bled to death. People died. Because they were trusting in rich folks in Washington. I don't mean to sound ugly, but they don't give a squat about me and you. We ain't nothing more than a customer. And when we quit being a good customer for them, they'll jump on a plane and go to Sweden. America, we have lost in leaders with integrity. I can't think of a, one really good political leader. You'd have to go all the way back to, to, to JFK. I believe that when they killed him, we lost the last president that really cares about people. I hate to sound so tough this morning, but it's a tough message. You need a sharp axe. And you need to invest in lighters and matches. Write that down. Lighters and matches. Every survival kit, everybody that plans for a disaster needs to have lighters, not one, but plenty of lighters and matches. And number seven, write this down. In a disaster, ladies' high heels and disasters don't go together. Disaster means that something has happened so bad that you have got to flee home. Hiking boots, hmm, good idea. Tennis shoes, good idea. High heels, bad idea. And you need to have good shoes, comfortable shoes for everybody in your family. Number eight, you need a flashlight and or a lantern. And I advise both. And plenty of batteries. And rotate those batteries. What am I going to do with all these batteries, Brother Harris? When they get old, rotate them out. 
Be wise as a little ant. You know, I got a beehive with 80,000 bees in it. <laughs> I didn't count them all. I just took it and figured it up by math. They don't mind me getting my cut out of the hive. I ain't been bit one time. But I'm going to tell you something. If I went into that beehive and took everything out of it and didn't leave them nothing for winter, I wouldn't have a beehive next year. You ain't got to rob the whole beehive to do what I'm telling you. You can gather these things a little alone. Not only are you going to need a flashlight and a lantern, but for a plan to survive a disaster, you're going to need a good transistor radio. Now, a radio comes in handy because the government uses radio frequencies and signals. Police use radio frequencies and signals. Somebody say amen. You can get a radio signal out when no other form of communication will work. I know that because I was a strategic microwave systems repairman in the United States Army. My MOS was 26 Victor 20. Invading foreign armies will be communicating. And a transistor radio up will pick them up. So if you're in a disaster and you saw a big flash up north and, you know, everything's blowed down and, and, and you, you turn your radio on and, and you hear Chinese guys talking, <laughs> pray, 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 <laughs> we're in bad trouble. Thank God revelations don't say that China's going to march 200,000 men into America. They'll try it on Israel, but they got a big surprise coming. <coughs> you need communication equipment. I think that walkie-talkies is a good investment. I'm just going to throw that out there as number 10. Have an emergency cell phone that works. <laughs> Pay your cell bill. You never know when a disaster is going to happen. Have you a good cell phone? Number 11. Now, my list here says a Swiss army knife. But I've been in the military. I'm a hunter. You don't need a Swiss army knife. You need a big bug knife. <laughs> I'm talking about one of, them, one of them big hunting knives. With serrated edges on it. That's what kind of knife you need. Because you can chop down little trees with it and make a lean-to shelter. Can I get a witness? You watch Survivor, man. Surely you know this. He don't pull out a, a little Swiss Army knife. The brother pulls out a big, long, sharp knife. Cuts down some wood. Somebody say amen. And when you ain't cutting down wood and stabbing dogs, you might have to use it to stab somebody. And now I'm getting serious because in a disaster, it's usually, if, if it's a certain level disaster, it's every man or woman or boy or girl for their self. And I'll show you how to fix that dilemma in just a minute. But get a big knife. Invest in a good knife. One of my friends years ago Pete Starnes, he called me the other day. I'm supposed to start coming back to church. For Christmas one year, he bought me a big, long, black bug knife. And I've still got it today. And I'll always have it. Because a good steward is always going to have a knife. Are you ready for number 12? Bring the soap. Personal hygiene items. Pack some up. You're going to need them. Any group that you're going to want to join up with in a disaster, because that's part of the planning and survival, is, is to join up with a group. Nobody likes to be around somebody that don't smell good. You can be poor, you can be in a disaster, but you can still keep your skin clean. 
and keep your body hygiene. Somebody say amen. Pack some of that stuff up to make you smell good, to clean you up a little bit. Number 13, and I don't believe in bad luck. This is good. Every family needs a first aid kit and some medical supplies. Because you never know in a crisis if you're going to get hurt or in the crisis, you may become hurt. Or someone in your family or your next door neighbor. And I hate to even tell you this one, but it's something you got to do. Number 14, you need to store extra gasoline around. That's so important. Extra gasoline. Just in case where you live, the gasoline supplies run out. <laughs> Please don't look at me like, like naive children. Akbadinajog said it would be easy for us to cl- close the Strait of Hormuz. Of course, the American Admiral said, yeah, and it would be easy for us to blow him completely out of the water. But if that incident happened, all prices, speculations, are y'all with me? It's going to go out the roof. We don't know, we don't know the results of, of, of that kind of situation. You just don't know. Saudi Arabia says, oh, if they do that and, and y'all have to take uh, Iran out, we'll supply extra oil. But you know what? I don't like, I just don't like trusting in the Saudi Arabian people. They've lied to America too much. No, oh, don't even get me started on that one. I will. They was on donkeys living in tents. We went over there with our technology. We drilled their oil. We set them up. And they throwed us out. And now they're charging us with outrageous prices. It's a shame and a disgrace how they've done America. Yeah, I'll say it. America wouldn't be in a financial crisis today if we made the Iraqi oil wells pay for our military expenditures over there. But that's a whole other subject. Get you some extra gas. Because you never know when a crisis hits, it may not be safe for you to stay in your area. And you may have to have enough gas to get to an extra long distance where there will be a safe place. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Take a sewing kit, number 15. Write that down, i got to hurry. You're not going to be able to run out and buy new clothes in a disaster for your family. So what do you do? You patch. You sew. Also, sewing kits... Sews up more than clothes. If you get my drift. I believe. I'm probably going to take a a rap on this. But hey. I've been a pastor 30 something years. You can hate me. and I've I've got tough skin Scott. I know folks ain't going to like to hear preachers say this. But buy a gun. It's still your free right as an American. Now, I know they're trying to take them away from us, but go on out and buy you a gun to defend your family. Yeah, somebody ought to give God a hand clap. My God, don't leave me out here. Don't leave me out here on the stump all by myself. Yes, our Constitution gives us the right to bear arms. And I'm proud of the Constitution. And I think the American people are to be willing to fight and die for the American Constitution. I want to remind every veteran that watches this video, we swore an oath before God that we would defend the Constitution of the United States of America. If any man dares take that Constitution away or alter it, we we are under a vow to defend it before God. Now somebody give God a hand clap. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying don't mess. Don't mess with the American Constitution. Those are fighting words. And every veteran ought to 
feel steered up in their heart to hear another veteran say that. I will go to war against you. Whether you're an enemy from the outside or the inside, don't mess with the Constitution. It's a sacred document given to us by God. You not only need a gun, but you're going to need a compass. Everybody write down, I need a compass. You need a compass because if you're forced into the wilderness and under some kind of nuclear attack, dirty bomb, that's where people will go. You'll be directed to go into the wilderness. Have y'all saw that documentary? I'm not kidding here now. I'm serious. Where all the major governments of the world has got a plan. The the military governments of the world, the, the dominating powers, they have a plan, a real plan, in case we're invaded by aliens. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. This is the truth. The United States, China, Russia, they're all in it. In case we're invaded by aliens, they've got a military plan. So why I think it's strange that a little Holy Ghost preacher wants his parishioners to prepare and plan to survive a disaster. When they think the Martians are coming. i tell you who is coming, but he ain't an alien. He's the owner of the universe. His name is Jesus. Somebody say amen. His name is Jesus. He will come back, but no weapons formed against him will prosper. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. You're going to get me on that. <laughs> Woo! I feel the Holy Ghost. Everybody needs a backpack, a hiking backpack, so you can carry your stuff in. Now, write this down. I'm going to skip on past the backpack. Some of you are going to do a suitcase regardless of what I say. But, this one here is a wise ant that will do this one. They will get in a good community before disaster happens. Man, don't miss this one. A good steward, a wise believer, is going to get deeply connected To a good group of people before disaster ever happens. Because listen to me carefully. John, I'm so, I'm so glad you're here. In New Orleans, if you don't remind me, go back and watch some old news footage. The people were so scared and terrified in New Orleans. Those that did try to ride it out and stay in there and guard their property. Even the police was looting and stealing. This is well-known stuff. Guess what they had to do to get some of those people to give up their guns and come out where they could help them? They had to get the pastors, the pastors to go in to the suburbs and talk the people out of their houses. They were so paranoid, so gunshot, so abused, so afraid. Listen to me carefully. The best plan for surviving a disaster is get connected into a local church. Do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Somebody better clap for Jesus. I said you need to be involved in your church. Amen. I wouldn't mind going out there and telling my members, hey, it's Brother Frankie, come on out. These guys ain't going to hurt you. But if you ain't going to my church and you got a shotgun, I'm not going to go talk you out of your house. I'll tell the police I'll pray for you all. Good luck. Go to church enough so the pastor knows who you are. And you know what? If you'll do that, Jesus might figure out who you are. I knew I was going to get going to church in this thing somehow, didn't you?
but it's a proven survival strategy that works. Be connected to a community. And always have a backup plan for your plan. Everybody needs a safe place to go when your place is not safe. Somebody say amen. Have a backup plan. Backup plans means that when you've stocked and you've prepared and you realize that your place is not going to be a safe place, get out of there and go to your backup safe place. And today that concludes my lecture on how to prepare and plan to survive a disaster. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention.